between Hebrew College and Andover Newton School of Theology, partnerships between all, among all of the 10 schools of the Boston Theological Institute, partnerships between BU School of Theology and other, de other departments of, and colleges of Boston University, and longtime partnerships that have been growing among Andover Newton, Hebrew College, and Boston University School of Theology. Now, partnership shows up in a lot of different ways, some of which are on the table back there with events coming up. And during the reception, you'll have a chance to look at those. The third key word is leadership. What does it mean to be a leader, to be a thought leader, a research leader, an activist leader? And that is at the heart of a panel that's focused on religion and race in the 2016 presidential election of the United States. So tonight we, uh, we are going to dive right in. I'm going to introduce the moderator of the panel, um, who is himself quite a distinguished leader and who will introduce the panelists and then we will simply dive right in. Rabbi Daniel Lehman is the president of Hebrew College and under his leadership, Hebrew College has expanded deepened its roots and become a vital, an even more vital part of Boston and the larger, the larger Jewish and larger interfaith community. Rabbi Lehman is also dedicated to interreligious relationships and interreligious leadership. So as the chair of the Boston Theological Institute Board of Trustees, he is he is giving us leadership to move into a new day of interreligious leadership. And he has been a leader with us in the School of Theology in building a collaboration between Hebrew College and Boston University School of Theology in order to share events, courses, and, and a journal, which Andover Newton has been a part of and will continue to be active in in various ways as we go forward. We are so fortunate to be a part of a community that fosters this kind of citizenship, partnership, and leadership. So let's turn ourselves over to Danny Lehman. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear? Great. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here, uh, first of all, because I'm a major fan of uh, Mary Elizabeth Moore. And, uh, and I'm sure many of you here are as well. Um, but very simply, just the opportunity to be working with Mary Elizabeth on the BTI board, uh, and now through this partnership that Hebrew College and the BU School of Theology um, in formation is happening, really uh, provides me with a great joy and blessing to be able to, uh, to partner and collaborate with Mary Elizabeth, and more broadly with the BU School of Theology. And we really see this particular evening um, as an opportunity to publicly launch this partnership. It's built upon the relationship that Hebrew College has had with Andover Newton Theological School and the other schools of the BTI. Um, but we are very hopeful that this particular partnership is going to be uh, very fruitful and productive and compelling, not only for our students and faculty, but for the broader community here in Boston, and that's why this particular event in which we're exploring something 
that is of real common concern and interest, uh, race and religion in this presidential election, uh, is a fitting way to begin this partnership uh, in its public expression. So thank you very much, uh, Mary Elizabeth, for hosting um, and for being such a wonderful partner as we uh, launch this new venture together. Um, I'm very uh, honored to uh, really just introduce uh, our uh, distinguished scholars uh, who are going to give brief presentations in general on this question and their perspective, and then we'll have a few questions that I'm going to pose to them, and then we're going to open it up and uh, hopefully have a robust, vibrant conversation uh, in which we all can participate. So uh, let me begin by uh, brief introductions. There are obviously um, more extensive bios in the program, so I'm going to keep it brief as well. Uh, Susanna Heschel, who is Chair of Jewish Studies and Professor of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College. Um, she's a distinguished scholar in the area of uh, Jewish-Christian relationships, especially in the context of 19th century Germany, which is an area of interest of mine as well, having uh, descended from uh, German uh, refugees. Um, and she um, has written extensively uh, about Jewish-Christian relationships in the context of issues of political and democratic import. And obviously, um, we are in the 21st century in the United States, uh, but she has, I think, some very, very important and compelling things to say uh, from a historical perspective and from a religious studies perspective uh, that are relevant to our particular situation as we think about race and religion here in 2016 in the United States. So Susanna, welcome. Wonderful to have you. And Stephen Prothero, I'm sh I, I know, is doesn't require any introduction at Boston University, but I'm excited uh, to be with him uh, because he's such an important part of the conversation, the public conversation, about uh, religion in America and religious literacy in America. Um, his books um, are, you know, have been very, very important to that public discourse about the role that religion plays. And as a historian of religion in the United States of America, he has obviously uh, important perspectives and context to provide us as we think about what's happening right now uh, within the next week uh, and what are the implications for uh, the United States of America society uh, in relationship to religion. As we all know, uh, religion plays a, a significant role in American public life and politics in a way that many of our European counterparts don't exactly understand. Um, and uh, we have a unique situation uh, given the role of religion, but we're also in a unique place in the 21st century because of the changing landscape of religion in the United States. Um, I just started reading the book, The End of White Christian America, uh, and I think a lot of what we uh, need to be processing this evening has to do with what are the changes that are taking place that this particular presidential election has revealed. And so what we're going to do is ask each of them, and we're uh, waiting for our third um, presenter, uh, Saida Gundi, who's also uh, a scholar here at Boston University in sociology and African American studies. Uh, so she's going to bring, uh, obviously, a unique perspective, um, specifically in the area of race and religion. And that's going to be important for this conversation. And when she arrives, uh, she'll just join in the conversation uh, with her presentation. So again, we're going to have about 10 minute presentations. I'll ask a few questions to get us started, and then we're going to open it up. So um, take notes uh, and uh, record what you'd like to ask so that we can keep the conversation moving uh, smoothly. Susanna. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be able to see the people I'm talking to, so I'm going to stand up. <laughs> So I come to this question of our discussion today, first of all, as a historian uh, and as a Jew. As a historian of Nazi Germany, and the question has been asked, I'm sure you've read it in the newspapers, to what extent do we see support for Trump paralleling the support for Hitler, at least in the late 1920s, early 1930s, the first years, perhaps, of the Third Reich, and people debate it. I definitely see the parallels. I've worked on this, and I've worked on the responses of the Protestant church to Hitler, including those who supported Hitler. So I'm very interested in those historical parallels. And I would also say that in, 
our ability to evaluate what's going on in this very moment in the United States is limited. It will grow with a little bit of distance. And I just wish I could be alive in 100 years to see how historians evaluate this. I do hope very much that we all keep notes. Because as a historian, you know archival material is very important. And I'm really serious about this. You should keep diaries. You should record what you hear, what you observe, how you feel, what you think, and save it because historians in the future will find that very valuable. Now, what, what do I see going on here? On the one hand, I hear people saying, look, this is all a joke. Clinton is definitely winning. There's nothing to worry about, and so on. I also hear people debating, to what extent is Trump revealing, exposing something that's latent in the United States, and to what extent is he causing it? And those, of course, are the kinds of things we're going to be debating. But I have to say that it leaves me with a sense of great worry, borderline despair, even though I know as a Jew it is forbidden to despair, because this isn't where I thought we were going. So when I grew up, uh, I grew up, my father was involved in the civil rights movement, and of course I thought we were heading in a very different direction in this country. How do we explain this? The New York Times had some interesting articles yesterday, today, they talked about support for Trump coming from people not who are impoverished, but people with very little education. Why do they have little education? Because the states aren't giving money to the schools. We all know this. And we have been sitting back and allowing this to develop. All right, what is the mood out there? The mood reminds me of Germany in those years. The mood of resentment, resentment the sense of victimization, of fear, the way in which complex issues are being brought out as simple little well, resolutions, little, little answers to very complex problems. I worry that in fact, even though we have made great strides in asserting a principle of human rights, especially after World War II, that is a principle that says not national rights, international rights, that we are human beings, that we go beyond national commitments, that we're losing that, that perhaps that was too tenuous. We didn't. We, we educators, failed in this respect. We failed as religious leaders to imbue the country with moral principles and a sense of pride in those moral principles. I worry that there are people out there, including Trump, feigning ignorance when he says, I don't know who David Duke is. Come on. I want to ask my, ask my Jewish community, what is going on? You say the end of white Christian America, is this the end of the Jews? What is it to be a Jew now? What is it? Why, does it, why is it that the two newspapers that endorse Trump are the Las Vegas newspaper owned by Sheldon Adelson and the newspaper of the Ku Klux Klan? Those are the two newspapers? I say it's time for a big Yom Kippur in the Jewish world. <laughs> what, has, what have we wrought with this man? Sheldon Adelson. If you don't know who he is, <laughs> yes. What does it mean, make America great again? What is really, what is being said in that moment? What is it to be great? What do we aspire to in this country? What kind of rhetoric are we speaking of? And what kind of psychological appeal comes through with that? You know, I think we have a responsibility as religious leaders and as educators. First of all, as Bill Coffin always used to say, religion comes, yes, to comfort people, but also to make people uncomfortable. And we need to make some people very uncomfortable. We need to talk, and I again remember how Bill, you know who Bill Coffin was, yes? I hope. Bill Coffin used to say, look, in the uh, anti-nuclear uh, armament movement, just say to somebody reading the newspaper in an airport lounge, you know, just say, hmm, a thousand nuclear warhead, we really need a thousand? Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't five do? Or make some little comment. Put in a word here and there. Sparks of interest, but have courage. And I think sometimes we lack courage to speak to the people who need to be spoken to. At the same time, I also worry that often we focus too much on our anger when we want to analyze the racism on the other side. 
we can analyze in great detail and with great subtlety in universities when we see something racist have. Of course, we analyze the language and the mood and the tone of voice. But how do we confront people? And there I think sometimes we've made a mistake by confronting with anger, by expressing our anger and our impatience instead of being transformative. People can't be transformed that way. And we need to find other methods. It is not political for us to talk to people who agree with us. It is not political to have a rally where we all agree, whether it's, let's say, I went to a J Street rally, wonderful, a conference, everybody agreed. Very nice, we shook hands, we smiled at each other, patted each other on the back. What kind of politics is that? That's not political. To be political is to talk to people who disagree and change their minds, talk to them. And sometimes I worry that we don't do that. We're too cozy in our own little corners with our own friends. Look, ultimately, I ask myself, who is the suffering servant in America today? Have we reached those people? The racism that's coming through, the fact that a black church yesterday was burned, as you may have read in the paper, black churches burn, and they write on the front of it, vote Trump and paint a swastika on this church. What's going on in this country? Yes, we thought it was over, and it's not over, and we have a task to do, and it's a very big one. And frankly, we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged in the future to know if we have been amongst the vulgar or amongst a saving remnant that's going to keep this country alive, because I do worry that this country feels very vulnerable and fragile right now. So, finally, Jewish tradition says we're never given a task too great for us to accomplish. We're taught by the prophets that evil is never the climax of history, that we have to be strong and we have to have courage, as David tells his son Solomon on his deathbed. I hope very much that in the future, the generations that come are not going to be saying Kaddish for us. I hope very much that we can keep alive the vision and the promise, and that we can remember that people's lives depend on what we're going to be doing in the coming months and years. Thank you. Um, it's really nice to be here. It's always nice to be on a panel with Susanna. <laughs> We've known each other for many years. Not too many years, just a few years. <laughs> We're not old or anything. Um, but uh, thank you uh, to Dean Moore and uh, Rabbi Lehman. Can you get it higher? Turn it up? Okay. I'm going to make four uh, quick observations as a historian of American religions. Um, and more narrowly as the author of a recent book on the history of the culture wars in the United States. So that's my, that's my perspective, both historical and, and looking at the election through the culture wars. My first observation is that there's more continuity than discontinuity in this election on race. In other words, Trump is not an outlier on the question of African Americans in the United States. The modern Republican Party was built on a Southern strategy that ran through uh, Barry Goldwater's opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, through Nixon's Southern strategy, um, through the founding of the Moral Majority in 1979 in opposition to segregation academies, uh, through Reagan, uh, the Reagan coalition, which was built on support of white evangelicals and dog whistles on um, race. The difference between this legacy um, in the Republican Party and Donald Trump is that the dog whistles have been replaced by overt um, white nationalism. But uh, there's more continuity than discontinuity. This, uh, my second point is that there's more continuity than discontinuity in this election on religion, as well as on the question of race. There's a misperception um, that Donald Trump is not a culture warrior. In other words, that the questions of morality and religion um, have kind of fallen away in this election, that um, Trump is not interested in 
prosecuting the question of abortion unless asked in a debate. He's really not interested in the gay marriage question. Um, and so really we're in a post-culture wars moment. This is what we can read in the newspaper. But the contemporary culture wars, uh, which focused on, to some extent, on abortion and gay, and gay marriage, were never just about sex. They were also about race and about textbooks and about art and about history, perhaps most importantly. So the culture wars as I see them throughout American history are heated battles over moral uh, and uh, religious questions that concern the meaning of America and more importantly, who is and who is not a true American. And if that definition is correct, then we've been having these culture wars battles ever since the beginning of uh, the nation. The founders left unresolved two key issues. One was slavery, the other was religion. And we've been fighting about each of these questions um, ever since. So while it is true that Trump is relatively uninterested in abortion and gay marriage, he is, in my view, a quintessential culture warrior, driven by nostalgia for the good old days, anxious over forms of life that, in his view, are passing away, blaming certain racial and ethnic and religious groups for sending the country to ruin, and seeking to excommunicate from the American family um, some of these people, all in the name of making America great again. The big question in, this, uh, in the election is the same question culture warriors have debated from the beginning of the country, namely whether the United States is a multi-religious, multi-ethnic, and multi-racial nation, or whether it is a white nation or a Christian nation. Again, this is not a new question. This was a question in the election of 1800 when Americans tried to decide whether they might elect Thomas Jefferson, who was not a traditional Christian, to be president. It was the main issue in the anti-Catholic and anti-Mormon culture wars of the 19th century, and the Islam wars that we're in the midst of now, those culture wars are about the same question. The country has always been divided between cultural conservatives who have a centripetal view of the nation as all coming together into one Christian or perhaps Judeo-Christian center, and uh, uh, cultural liberals who have a centrifugal view of the nation where it's spinning out more and more um, ideas and uh, ethnicities and religions, and that in that multiplicity is to be found the strength of the country. What this election has um, done is laid bare these divisions rather than manifest new ones. It has made plain our traditions of white supremacy and male privilege and Christian power. It's exposed the ways in which American society has valued black lives less than white lives over the course of American history, Muslim lives less than Christian lives, immigrant lives less than native lives. So those are my first two points about um, Trump representing continuity rather than discontinuity in the question of race and religion in the United States. My last two observations are about uh, Trumpism itself. Uh, the first is that the Trump story is not just an American one, and sec second point is that the Trump story is not just about racial and uh, religious bigotry, and Susanna was hinting at this a minute ago. Um, there are Donald Trumps all over the world uh, right now. I was at a conference a couple weeks ago in Venice that was focused uh, where scholars came from Turkey, from uh, India, from uh, Western Europe, from the United States, to talk about the rise of strongmen and the rise of majoritarianism and illiberal democracy in Turkey and India and Western Europe. And what focused the, country, uh, the uh, conference was the idea that these phenomena are somehow linked, that Trump has something to do with Brexit, which has something to do with Modi in India, which has something to do with, um, with what's going on in, t in uh, Turkey. And the most obvious linkage that would bring all these seemingly disparate uh, facts together is, is economics, the economic transformation of the world that we're living through. From southern Ohio to New Delhi, there are millions and millions of people who have been displaced by the new uh, global economy. And in many cases, they are flocking to these um, strong men like Modi in India and Erdogan in, in Turkey. As uh, Eddie Glaudy points out, in his new book, Democracy in Black, which my students, some of whom are here tonight, thank you. Thank you for coming to support your professor. <laughs> um, are reading this semester, my religion and politics semester, um, Glaudy um, argues that many of the displaced in this new economic economy, in this new uh, global economy, are African Americans who suffered horrible losses during the downturn 
um, of the last decade losing jobs and homes at far greater rate, rates than whites or, or Latinos. But we're also reading a book called Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. And in this book, this memoir, he points out that white privilege has done very little to solve the economic and cultural problems of poor white people in Appalachia who are flocking to Trump because they feel they have become invisible to Clinton and to the Democratic Party, which seems to care more about immigrants and refugees in their view than about former coal miners with black lung disease. What Vance's book demonstrates is that not everybody is voting for Trump for reasons of religion or race. Many are voting for him for economic reasons, because they lost a factory job, because their hometown is dying, because their mother and brother are heroin addicts, because the Democratic Party, which used to be a party of the working class and even the poor, has increasingly become a party of the middle class and of Wall Street. No matter how the election goes in a few days, the nation is going to be roughly evenly divided between Clinton and Trump supporters. This is not something you would know by walking around Harvard Square or by walking around the School of Theology, but it's true nonetheless. This is not going to be a landslide either way. There will be no mandate for either candidate. The prophecy of uh, Robert Jones's uh, book that Rabbi Lehman just invoked, The End of White Christian America, um, another book we're reading in our seminar, um, is for now at least a bit premature. We have not yet seen the end of white Christian America. In fact, we may see the next president who represents white Christian America. The Hamiltonian America uh, of Broadway, run by black and brown Im immigrants, also remains a fantasy of, uh, of uh, the musical world of New York City. No matter who you are voting for, close to half of your fellow Americans are voting the other way. A few weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C for a project um, that's called the Inclusive America Project. It's run by uh, Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, and uh, David Gergen, a CNN uh, political commentator. Uh, and one of the speakers was uh, a Muslim activist and comedian named Wajahat Ali. And he was asked to speak about what it is like uh, to live in America today as a Muslim. And he was very funny and informative as he spoke, but in the end he said, uh, what is it like to be a Muslim today? He said, it's exhausting to be a Muslim today. Uh, to be running around trying to uh, put out fires of various um, situations in various places. And he concluded his talk by saying that after the election there was going to be a lot of healing uh, to do. And I really took that to heart. And that's where I'd like to uh, conclude that I agree that there will be a lot of healing to do no matter what happens um, after uh, November 8th. Whether religious communities might be able to provide um, some sort of healing there is something that I hope we can discuss as we go forward today. So thank you very much for having me. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you both very much. Uh, there's a lot of rich uh, ideas um, that we can explore. And let me start off, and again, this is really just to be a catalyst um, for our broader conversation. Um, I'm curious, picking up, uh, Stephen, on your last point, to what degree do we think um, that religious leadership is going to be uh, critical and perhaps even more significant in healing that incredible divide? Uh, than political leadership, because it seems to be the case, as you pointed out, that we're not going to um, see political leadership emerge out of this election that's going to be uh, healing because of the nature of the split that's likely to take place and the lack of a landslide and lack of a mandate uh, that you mentioned. And I'm wondering to what extent, um, both with regard to racial and religious divides that have been uh, uh, very apparent, to what extent is the healing going to require a different kind of religious leadership and focus on this to emerge in the United States in the aftermath of uh, this presidential election? Uh, well, I would, uh, I would have a uh, pessimistic note about this. My, my sense is that one thing that we've seen with the uh, 
one effect of the culture wars has been political polarization. So, so uh, we used to confine this idea that, okay, here are these issues that we can't negotiate and we can't compromise on because they're matters of biblical truth or absolute morality. So they're questions like abortion or gay marriage. Uh, and so we do politics with them in a certain way. We just anathematize one another and we think it's a matter of good and evil and we exile people from the family of America if they disagree with us. Uh, and then over here, okay, well, we're willing to negotiate about the debt ceiling. You know. But what's happened uh, in recent years is that, that that distinction has actually broken down. So the, the modus operandi of the culture wars has become the modus operandi of politics. Right, so whether it has to do with a judicial appointment or whether it has to do with whether the uh, highest uh, you know, tax rate for income should be 36 or 39.3%, it's sort of a matter of absolute you know, morality and you can't compromise um, at all. Uh, so that's troubling and, and, uh, and I think that another feature of this has been that this uh, culture wars mentality has drifted out not into just all of politics but into all of culture so that Politics is just taking over everything. Everything is political. I mean, this is one of the insights that Stephen Colbert had in his, in his comedy show, that you know, even, even uh, truth and science now have become left-wing and right-wing sorts of things. I mean, he was making fun of that, but that's really become the reality in which, uh, in which we live. And this is where I think religious, our religious institutions have largely failed us. I mean, you look at the support of white evangelicals for Trump at something like 75%. I mean, how, how, is that, how is that possible? You know, um, I went to uh, Utah a couple weeks ago and I gave a talk and I said, shame on you. You are going to vote for Donald Trump. You know, this is a person who is a religious bigot. You are the religious community that has been the um, subject of the greatest attempt by federal and state governments to get rid of a, of a religious tradition in American history. And you think it's, it's fine to be voting for this person who is going to win Utah. And a bunch of people got mad at me. No, he's not going to win Utah. You know, Evan McMullen's going to win Utah. And I said, you know, who is Evan McMullen? I've never even heard of this man. Um, he's doing better in the polls, but he's not going to win Utah. And Trump's going to win Utah. And so you have, here's two religious groups you might imagine would have good reason to oppose this person. And not only are they not opposing him, they're, they're supporting him. They're going to give a state 60% Mormon to Trump. They're, there's, you know, Jerry Falwell's son is supporting um, Trump. So I think we've got to a, a situation where politics has become so powerful and such a center of, uh, of identity in America that uh, people who have multiple identities, you know, where they're, okay, they're a white evangelical, but they're also a Republican, but they're also from Mississippi or from Massachusetts, they might feel a tension in those identities. But increasingly, those tensions are resolved by the political identities so that we're Republicans first and Mormons second. Um, and similarly, we're Democrats first and maybe uh, Episcopalian second or United Methodist second. So it's hard to see how religion does that prophetic thing that Susanna's father wrote about in his important book, Prophets. Um, how does it do that in a situation where it's lost its capacity to say no to, um, to the political Parties. Is that is that a process of secularization in a way that the political becomes dominant over the religion? I mean, Mike Pence says he's a Christian before he's a Republican. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't see any evidence of that. I mean, what, the, the evidence for that would be okay when your cr Christian commitments conflict with your. First of all, you have to have conflicts, and then you have to show the way in which those conflicts are resolved on the one side or the other. That's how you decide, right? But there don't ever seem to be any conflicts there. I mean, the same criticism was made of Cain, right, in, in, the, in the vice presidential debate, who's a Catholic, you know? How does he resolve so simply this question of abortion when his tradition is telling him to go another way on it? And it seems to be a very easy decision for him, rather than a painstaking one. If we could see Cain say, you know, yeah, I'm a Democrat, except for I'm such a Catholic that I, you know, I oppose my party on this, this, and that, then we might, we might have reason to believe that was happening. So I'm concerned about that. So, uh, first of all, I think we, one of the things that uh, in a way saves us is a sense that an eternal feeling about hypocrisy in religious communities. 
So the evangelicals have actually shown us who they really are. They weren't really worried about abortion all these years. They were worried about race. And now the curtain's been pulled away, and we see who they really are. And there's plenty of trouble coming to Falwell, by the way, from his students and right, others. Yes. I think that we're going to see a lot of fallen figures in the coming years. They've lost credibility. They've lost respect. But we also have elevated a lot of those people. I can tell you that in the Jewish world, we elevate sometimes the ultra-Orthodox who walk around in their Polish 19th century costumes, and they're the real pious ones, Chabad, because they offer you a wonderful Shabbat meal, and isn't that cozy and lovely, etc. And we put everything else to one side. Let me just tell you, and there was an article in the newspaper called The Times of Israel that reported about some ultra-Orthodox rabbis in Israel who came to say that the election of Trump is inevitable, and it's already been predicted in an ancient Jewish mystical text, the Zohar. He's going to win. But beyond that, you must vote for Trump, they said. Quote, vote for the man, because if a woman rules, it brings judgment, death, and poverty. Now. It's time for us who are not ultra-Orthodox or who are not evangelical to stop viewing these people as sweet, old-fashioned adherents of the true faith and really expose them for what they are. This has to stop because they do get a vote. So I think that not only are the, uh, the idols going to fall, we need to push them down. I have to say I don't understand if the New York Times says that the supporters of Trump are primarily people with little education. But something like 20% of a modern Orthodox Jews are voting for Trump. These are educated people who supposedly care deeply about religion and their religious commitments are supposed to infuse every moment of their lives. They're supposed to treat women even with dignity. You know, behind the curtain, but with dignity. <laughs> so what is going on? What? And therefore, what he says about I, I don't understand. When he uses a star of David with dollar bills, et cetera, you know what I'm talking about. When David Duke is endorsed about, and he, this is all right for Jews? What's the matter? What's going on in the Jewish world? So we have problems, too, I have to say. And they're uh, leaving many of us in a sense of despair. And yes, it's political. But yes, you know, I do believe that we human beings have a very strong instinct for what's right, what's hypocritical, what's decent. We really do. We just sometimes are afraid to speak it. Look, one other thing. Trump is created by the Tea Party. He's created by the Republicans, and they have to be held responsible. They're having trouble. We know that. But part of the problem is also what the state legislatures are doing. I know the Hillbilly Elegy. It's an important book. What have these Republican legislatures done to education? Yes, jobs. We're the vocational schools. Same thing happened in Europe, but the government immediately established schools to train people in the new technology. What about the horrific greed of the companies? They're taking excessive wages for the top people, and you know what's going on. Wages are meaningless at this point. How can you possibly earn $15 an hour and then spend $3 for a tube of toothpaste? It's impossible. Well, what about this greed? Doesn't that have to stop too? And who's going to stop it if not us in the religious community? So I'm curious about the fact that, interestingly, uh, in this election cycle, you had someone raising a lot of those issues, um, Bernie Sanders, who uh, garnered, obviously, interesting and incredible support beyond anything I could imagine. From a Jewish perspective, it was fascinating to watch uh, the first ever uh, Jewish serious national candidate for the presidency um, who was not um, acknowledging any way, in any kind of explicit way, um, that his idea of justice and or uh, his prophetic sense of what needed to happen in this country was coming from his religious tradition. And yet, it seems to me fascinating, and I'd, I'd like both of your, your comments on the fact that we just are at the conclusion of eight years of uh, Barack Obama's presidency, the first African-American president, quite popular. If you look at the, you know, his ratings at the end of this term, uh, very, very high uh, for a second-term president. 
Um, and yet, um, the voices that were carrying that message were, were not white Christian voices. And yet, what we end up with at the end of the presidential cycle are two very white, very Christian um, voices, which, which, from a cynical perspective, and I think, Stephen, you, you pointed out to this, either represent the kind of racial uh, uh, bigotry and sense of this as a white Christian country, or are aligned with Wall Street on the Democratic side. So in both cases, you have kind of these different elements of white, um, mostly Protestant America, at least historically, uh, being touted as the options that we have, and the non-white, non-Christian options, despite Barack Obama's success, um, seem to have fallen by the wayside in the aftermath of his presidency. Yeah, I mean, there's a big gap in the in the demographics in terms of the uh, end of white Christian America book by you know Bob Jones, Robert Jones, uh, between the demographics and the power, right? Steve, could you use the mic? Uh, Mike doesn't, Mike work, doesn't work, work, but I'll talk louder. Um, so there's a there's a real gap between um, between that. So if you look at the if you look at the U.S. Uh, Congress, for example, or the Senate, uh, <clears throat> that is really, uh, very, looks very different from the country, right? So, um, I mean, I was raised Episcopalian, you know, we, we have one third of the U.S. presidents still. <laughs> I mean, that's weird. I mean, there's like no Episcopalians left in the whole country. You know, how do we have one third of the presidency? Uh, so. I think there's a gap there, and I think that's right. That it fine, it's fine for Bernie Sanders to run. I think uh, you know he had he had a real problem with his religious identity. He started out as being a secular Jew who really pretty much said he was an atheist, and then very quickly his handlers like Bernie, you know, for running for president, you can't be an atheist. <laughs> so pretty soon Bernie was like, yeah, well, my God is helping other people, and my spirituality is, you know. You know, being concerned about the world, you know, he started talking in this kind of vaguely, uh, I don't know, yeah, maybe, <laughs> I, I thought it was a kind of Jesus, well, that's Jewish too, so I mean, I think that that was, um, but anyway, there's a gap there between how you actually make it to power. You look at people like Nikki Haley, you know, you can't, she's not going to be a Sikh, you know, running for governor, right, she has to she has to stop being that. She has to become a Christian, right? So there's still this pull toward uh, Christian identity if you wanna if you wanna you know make it in the political space. Well, better Bernie than Joe Lieberman, hmm? <laughs> who made his deals to keep us from having single payer health insurance. But perhaps we might say something else, which is that if you notice in the second debate, which was supposed to be a kind of town hall, and there was a, a woman, it was a Kind of woman who's a Muslim who asks the candidates, so where do you stand on the on Islamophobia? Something to that effect. Yeah. What did they both say? First Trump and then Clinton. And both of them immediately start talking about terrorism. Yeah. Mm. That was outrageous on both sides. And again, you see, what, what was that something she was trained to say? Yes. Because she thought it would win votes? Yes. Does she really think like this? Why does it... Because there's no votes to be... I mean, Muslims are less than 1%. And there's a lot of people who are worried about Muslims in America, and it doesn't it doesn't benefit her to come to the side of Muslims. It just doesn't do that. Well, I, what we're obviously <laughs> lacking is someone who can transcend those kinds of politics and give us something to aspire to, and give us a vision of what we might become as a country. And we don't seem to have that right now. I do sense it a bit in Cain. Uh, I sense it a bit in Sherrod Brown, their occasional leaders. But yes, that's it. What have we done to create this kind of country? What did we do that we came to this? What did we do that we had in the 60s? Great people. How did we go from, in my lifetime, there was Martin Luther King. And now what do we have? And now we have Trump? Where did we go wrong? And don't we all need to do a lot of soul searching? But it's probably the case that Martin Luther King could never have been elected president. <laughs> so despite the leadership on the political front, uh, the fact is, is that much of the American government was trying to figure out how to neutralize him. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, there is a thesis that this is the last gasp, right? That the civil rights movement was successful, that, that we have created a more multi-religious and multi-ethnic and multi-racial society. And, uh, and that this is the last protest, this is the last time anybody like this is gonna get anywhere near the presidency because the demographics of the country are changing so rapidly, because in fact, um, this you know, liberal media and liberal uh, 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 colleges and universities have been very successful in creating a country that is more, uh, you know, that is more inclusive. I mean, I think that's a more positive reading. Yeah. That was my reading until you know, a, a couple months ago when I thought, I thought Hillary Clinton was gonna win 360 electoral votes and she was gonna win by six to eight percent of the popular vote. Um, that's not gonna happen. Uh, so there won't be a clear, and, and the hopeful read there was, fine, you put up this person, clear repudiation. The American public says, no, we're not interested in this. Please do not give us another one of these people to run for president. But that isn't what's happening. So uh, I still think, historically, you can read this as a last gasp, last ditch thing, rather than um, another way, but that may be naive. Let's well, open. Can I just say one thing about this? I think it's a question, since this is a school of theology. I think a lot of us train as pastors and, and priests and rabbis, uh, as imams, we train, as teachers too, I would say, we train to help people who are in, in a terrible situation of, of despair, people facing death, people who are grieving. And we really want to be with them in their grief and, and, and help them and bring them out and accompany them. And we, we take that very seriously. I think that's perhaps the most important thing we need to do as religious leaders. But I ask, maybe we also need to think about how to be with people and transform the lives of people who are indeed so angry and so full of hate that they admire someone like Trump. People who are in such a state of vulgarity in their own lives. What can we do about that? And are there pastoral ways of approaching such people? Uh, that's something perhaps we should think about trying to work on. So questions? Please, yes. Um, I, I just had a question relating to, Stephen, something you said about the polarization of the electorate. I'm maybe as or more concerned about November 9th, and I'm sort of wondering if you guys have thoughts about the roles of educators and religious leaders with regard to the divisions that might be right in their own towns and communities. Even though Massachusetts is a fairly blue state, there are a lot of splits. And just in terms of the national conversation, how do we do some of that repair, recovery work? And how do we, as educators and religious leaders, assist with that? I suppose there's a lot of wisdom from reconciliation commissions that we can gain. Uh, there's a lot of reconciliation work that we haven't even begun at this point. I remember um, uh, you know, saying in a very matter-of-fact way, we have to pay reparations to African Americans for that question. And then the, the anger that came from that, I thought everybody agreed. Um, <coughs> <I th coughs> but clearly we need to do a lot of reparative work here. And I, I think that we, in theological schools, can contribute. Our third panelist, uh, for some reason, couldn't come, and um, I'm sure she had an excellent reason because it wouldn't be like her not to come, but Saida Grundy is um, a black feminist commentator on, social, on cultural issues. I cannot, I cannot channel Saida, I'm hopelessly white, but I do want to ask a question that might come out of... Um, of an African American or Asian, or Asian Americans or Latino Americans mouth, and that is, to what extent, as two historians, do you believe that the, the, the long culture of slavery in this country, the long practice of quotas for Japanese, Chinese, um, Mexicans, Nicaraguans, and many, many others around the world are part of who we are as a culture? And what is our job on November 9 in, in addressing those deep-seated attitudes and practices that are so much part of us? 
You know, one thing I wanted to say, uh, you know, when I was talking about the continuity of Trump uh, with the Republican uh, strategy since 1965, is there's a broader continuity, which is exactly this one, that, you know, the country was uh, founded with this idea, oh, all men are created equal, but it was also founded on, on the fact of slavery and on the fact of, well, the only men who were created equal enough to vote were with property and that women were not uh, able to vote and that when we get to the 20th century, oh, uh, Japanese Americans are, can't be Americans because they're not you know, Caucasians. And then, oh, a Sikh goes to the Supreme Court in 1923. Oh, I heard last year you just said you had to be Caucasian to be an American citizen. Well, I'm Caucasian. I, I'm from like, I couldn't be, who's more Caucasian than people from the Caucasus like me? <laughs> oh, no, actually, you know, what we mean when we say you have to be you know, a, a, a white person um, it, it, it constitutionally is that that's what people consider to be a white person. Uh -huh. And so even though you're technically a white person, you're not, you're not you know, like in a popular language a white person. So yes, this is a huge part of our legacy and I think there is a problem. This is, this is an argument Eddie Gladdy makes in his book, Democracy in Black. There is a problem with this idea that okay, we keep getting better, we keep improving. Um, and there's, there's truth to that. But I think the, the sort of easy way to get off off there is, well, we have these wonderful egalitarian ideals, and, and all people fall short of their ideals, and we keep trying to get uh, more in um, consonance with our ideals, and that's what the American project is. That's a kind of flattering uh, view of American history, and there's some truth to it. But the other piece of that is that actually, no, we've always had a, a hypocrisy about these ideals, and this is a country that was established on the basis of white supremacy. And that we see that happen with slavery. We see that happen with segregation. We see that happening with lynching. We see that happening with mass incarceration. These are not sort of weird things that just ha kind of happen to happen because we decide to have a war on drugs or something. This is sort of baked into the American project. This is part of how it works. This is part of how it operates. Um, and so we have racial habits, as Glaudi talks about. Um, whether we're black people or white people or Latinos or Latinas, whatever we might, might be. Um, and that's a problem. And that is, and you know, one, one virtue of Trump, if we can say this, and I think this is what Susanna was hinting at, is that part of etiquette, you know, part of Lee in the Confucian tradition that I talked about with uh, Yair, is uh, not saying certain things that you're thinking, right? Because that's not conducive of, you know, social interaction, right? So uh, one thing that Trump's done is done away with that etiquette, right? So now we just say whatever the hell comes to our mind. And some of those things that come to our mind are really racist and really ugly and really horrible. And so there's a virtue of having that out in public. But I think I'm enough of a Confucian to say that there's actually a real problem with that as well. That, you know, it's one thing to think on the side of your mind certain things, and it's another thing to say them, and it makes the country uglier and coarser. But it, it does make the country um, presented more clearly with the racial habits and attitudes uh, and, and uh, perspectives that have formed the country, and that we need to, to transform if we want to live up in any way to our ideals. So it's a huge challenge. And uh, I, too, find it depressing, you know, to say, hey, my dad marched with Martin Luther King. My dad didn't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my dad marched with Martin Luther King. What the hell is going on here? You know, um, what happened to this idea that things were getting better? Um, and uh, so it is, a, it is a, a difficult moment. But I think he, he is tapping into something that's very old in American culture. And it isn't something that's easy to, to turn away. I think it's interesting. I just came from uh, the inauguration of the new president at Brandeis, and there was a lot of discussion about what motivated the establishment of Brandeis and the anti-Semitism and the quotas. And it's, it's fascinating uh, as a white Jewish American to think about the extent to which, on the one hand, it seems that Jews in the United States have become part of the white majority. On the other hand, uh, this election, more than most, uh, has presented to me at least the sense of the white Christian nature uh, in that history. And um, 
it puts Jews in a funny position because on the one hand, we're not usually identified in that religious minority status and certainly not among university campuses in which we're disproportionately represented. Um, but there is a funny sense that on the one hand, Barack Obama you know, kind of represented us in a funny way as a minority um, and that this has uh, again kind of turned and revealed that underbelly, uh, which makes a lot of Jews nervous despite the fact that you have uh, portions of the Jewish community, as Susanna mentioned, uh, that are firmly supportive of, uh, of Trump. How is Trump likely to do among Jews vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Romney? Do you know? Like, is he doing better? Um, I don't know the answer. I don't think so because um, there. I know many prominent Republican Jewish Republicans who just can't, you know, can't stomach can't it. Can't go there. Yeah, they can't. In fact, Je Jeff Jacoby, who is, uh, you know, fairly conservative. Uh, <laughs> journalist um, at the Globe, at the Globe uh, was at Hebrew College recently, and he said he just can't do it. He, he could, you know, he just can't vote for him. And he and he actually called out a bunch of Jewish conservatives for what he co considered their hypocrisy around um, you know, religious issues, given Trump's you know uh, personality. I wanted to just say something in response, in part to 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 each of you, what you've said. Um, you know, your comment about Trump saying anything, yeah? Brought to my mind a wonderful book by John Cudahy called uh, The uh, Culture of Civility, or The Ideal of Civility, which is a book about Jews in Central Europe uh, before Hitler, and how Jews came to represent the id of society, yeah? The yid as id, <laughs> wonderful <laughs> phrase. Uh, and somehow Jews had to be the ones. They were the ones, and for that reason, it, it links that also to Jews being at the forefront of modernism and all, um, all kinds of experimental movements in, uh, in academic life and, and culture and so forth. And of course, what we're seeing right now is Trump is the id in America. And I just wonder if we might want to look comparatively and uh, try to understand why countries in a given moment, cultures, need to have an id to come to the fore. Why that id can't be, let's say, filtered through the ego in a more reasonable fashion. Regarding Jews, look, uh, the Jews have gotten far too close to the Republican Party in the course of the last couple of decades. And what's the reason? Why would a Jew vote for, for Trump or for any Republican? You know why. They vote, OK, some might say because of certain economic interests that they think they find, which is, of course, nonsense. But they vote because it seems to be those voting for Trump will say that some kind of imagined, and this is complete fantasy, imagined support for Israel, which really means Republicans for Bibi Netanyahu and his very bad policies, that that trumps, so to speak, <laughs> Trump's own use of swastikas. What is that? We have lost a sense, we have a terrible split in the Jewish community. We've lost a sense of Jewish values, and, uh, and it is a real crisis. What we're seeing in the American election right now has a certain parallel and a smaller scale in the Jewish community that needs very desperately to be addressed in a serious way. And finally, I want to say something about Jews and Islamophobia. The Center for American Progress, which was run by John Podesta, who's now Clinton's campaign manager, did a study four years ago. What organizations are paying for all the Islamophobic literature, et cetera, going on in this country? Seven major foundations of those four identified themselves as Jewish. How can that be? Why did Jews give an honor just a few days ago to Ali Hirson, uh, whatever her name is, um, et cetera? Why would this happen? Why did Jews identify with Islamophobia? What kind of self-destruction, for one thing, and destructiveness? Jews who've experienced racism and anti-Semitism? Jews who were at the forefront in the 19th century of positive scholarship on Islam, who started the field of Islamic studies in Europe in the 19th century, who were the greatest proponents of getting the colon European colonizers out of Egypt, out of India? What, what's happened? You're the president of Hebrew College. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen S. Durant. Uh, Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Um, 
I wish the presidency of Hebrew College provided me with a platform <laughs> to address any of those issues. Uh, but I am uh, I'm very uh, privileged, actually, to be with all of you, and at least to be able to um, have this conversation take place. Um, we said that we would uh, conclude around now in order to be able to have a reception uh, with everybody present, and I want to be able to do that. Uh, certainly, we're here to continue the conversation uh, at that reception. And again, I want to thank uh, the BU School of Theology and Dean Mary Elizabeth Moore for hosting us. And again, we look forward to developing this relationship through the courses, the public events, uh, and the programs for students and faculty. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, all of you will have an opportunity to uh, be with us on the Hebrew College campus soon. So thank you very much.